It's no secret that coding interview performance is not indicative of software engineering performance. Some of the best programmers I know consistently fail coding interviews. I want to examine why that happens and share some advice that you can use to avoid falling into the same traps. Now, there are many types of coding interviews, but for the purposes of this video, we are mostly focusing on data structures and algorithms, as these are the most common interviews, at least at big tech companies. That said, of course, most of this still applies to any type of coding interview. Now to understand why somebody might fail a coding interview, I think the best thing to do is to work backwards. We can start at the criteria for passing a coding interview and then work through that criteria to see all of the different mistakes that could be made and how to avoid those mistakes. And some of these mistakes will be things that you might not even know could have been a mistake or things that you didn't know you were even doing in the first place. Of course, this criteria can differ from company to company, but for the most part, it's actually pretty consistent. So in an interview round, you're going to have probably about five coding interviews. And of these coding interviews, each interviewer is going to give you a rating. This rating will be on some scale. For example, the most common scale I've seen is going to be from strong no hire to strong higher. To be confident that you're going to get an offer, you need to have strong positive feedback from every single interviewer. Just a single no hire or strong no hire decision could mean not getting an offer. To be clear, it doesn't mean for sure that you won't get an offer. You absolutely can get an offer if you have a no hire decision from one of your interviewers, but it makes it far less likely. So ultimately what you want to do is find a way to be as consistent as possible with your interview performance to give yourself the best chance of getting that offer. Okay, so then how do we get a strong hire decision? Well, for this, each interviewer has four criteria points that they usually use. This is going to be algorithms, coding, communication, and problem solving. And for each of these four points, you're going to get some rating, usually on a scale from one to four, saying how good you did in this particular point, and then those ratings will be combined together in some way to form your overall rating of higher, no higher, or somewhere else on that scale we saw before. So now what I want to do is break down each of these four criteria points to show the rubric essentially that the interviewers are using to grade you on this and how you can avoid common pitfalls that cause people to fail on each of these four criteria points. So first we have algorithms. And algorithms for most people is what they think of when they think of scoring a coding interview. If I ask somebody how they did in an interview, they're going to tell me if they got the question right or wrong. And this is mostly encompassed in this algorithms criteria point. And of course, to do well on the algorithm section, you just need to study. You'd be surprised how many software engineers I know that think, well, I'm a good software engineer, so I don't need to study for coding interviews. But this just isn't the case. Unless your job regularly is using algorithms, you are not going to know enough about algorithms to do well in a coding interview, so you do need to study it. And to study it, I'll put a list up here of different things I would recommend you study, and also make sure you are just getting reps in to use these different algorithms on practice problems using sites like AlgoExpert or LeetCode. That said, another key component to this algorithms category is going to be time and space complexity. Not only do you need to get the questions correct, you need to know what the space and time complexity is of your solution. So as you are practicing, don't just move on once you pass the test cases. Instead, once you finish a solution, write out what that time and space complexity is to test yourself and then check to make sure that you are correct. Additionally, if there are multiple possible solutions, even ones that you think just can't be good solutions, get in the habit of using time and space complexity as the primary factor to decide which of these solutions is the best solution Although, of course, you should also be considering other things, such as the code complexity of implementing different solutions. Next up, we have coding, which is another category that I think people sort of think that, oh, I'll just do well here because I'm good at coding, but this isn't the case. We're not just being graded on our ability to write code that compiles and works. We're being graded on our ability to write code that is actually clean code. Probably the biggest mistake I see in the coding section is using bad variable names. You might think, oh, if I just use a one letter variable name or some abbreviation, it's going to be easier for me to write out. But as a result, your code is going to be less readable and thus less clean. This also just means that your interviewer is going to have a harder time following along, which is going to hurt you in other criteria points, such as the communication. Also try to write code that follows a good structure. This might be something you naturally do, but in the stress of the moment in a coding interview, it can be easy to get away from this. 
So for example, if you have some repeated code, move that repeated code into a helper function. This way you are following dry principles, which is just going to make your code much cleaner. Another thing to look out for is deeply nested conditionals. Now, sometimes this is just necessary, but if you have multiple if checks nested inside of each other, see if there's a way that you can either combine some of those or remove some of them using early return statements. Another thing you can do that a lot of people don't do is at the end of the interview, if you have extra time, you can either use that time to clean up your code a little bit or just communicate with the interviewer about how you could clean up that code before making it production ready. And as a result of this, you can just show the interviewer that you care about code quality and that you know how to write good, clean code. And this can cause you to actually get a higher score in the coding section. And thinking about communication, of course, the next category is communication. It's not enough to just get a correct solution. You need to be able to communicate every step of the way, how you got to that solution and why that solution is correct. It's easy to get in this mindset of just head down coding. I'm going to code, code, code and get this solution as quick as possible. But if you do this and you're not communicating with the interviewer, they're just going to be lost and watching you code and you're going to do bad on the communication section as well as you might end up doing poorly on other sections as well if they're not able to follow along with your thought process. When I personally take a coding interview, I try to get in the same mindset that I use when I'm teaching. If you've ever taught a coding class before, you know if you write just one line of code and don't explain that line of code to the class, you're going to lose at least a few students. And the same is essentially true for a coding interview. You need to be explaining everything you do. So my personal strategy is to break the code I'm going to write up into different chunks. And for each chunk, before I write that code, I explain what I'm about to do. So this is the function I'm about to implement, or this is what this for loop is about to do. And then as I implement that code, I explain with each line of code why I wrote the line of code in the way that I did. Now, try not to go overboard here. For example, your interviewer knows what a for loop is, and they know that you know what a for loop is too. So you don't need to explain to them what a for loop is every time you write one. But instead, you should explain to them the decisions you are making with a for loop. Why are you choosing the stopping condition that you were choosing? Why did you choose to use a for loop in general instead of using a while loop or recursion or no loop at all? Those are the things you should be explaining, the thought process behind them all, but you don't need to explain how to code to the interviewer. Another key component to communication that a lot of people mess up on is communication outside of when you are writing code. So for example, before you write any code, you should be communicating already with your interviewer to explain to them your thought process and how you are going to begin to approach the problem they have given you. A common mistake can be to be afraid of saying something that's incorrect. And as a result of this, you end up just not saying much at all. But instead of doing this, what you can do is say something along the lines of, I'm not quite sure yet, but one thing I'm considering is this solution. And then walk through that solution and your thought process of how you're going to narrow it down and figure out if that solution is a correct solution or not. And as you are doing this, you should be discussing these different solutions that come to mind in terms of all of the things we've talked about before. So in terms of which ones have a better time and space complexity, or potentially if just one might be incorrect and not going to work, describe why that solution actually isn't going to work and then just move on. And next we have problem solving. And to be clear with problem solving, you don't actually need to solve the problem to get a good score in problem solving. You just need to demonstrate good problem solving skills. For example, when I interviewed at Facebook, the phone screen, I actually got the problem wrong, but I still passed that interview and the interviewer actually told me they thought I did a very good job. And this was a result in part to the fact that I demonstrated good problem solving skills, even if I wasn't able to use those to get to the perfect solution. To some extent, problem solving is more closely related to communication than it is to actually solving the problem. So as a result of this, it's super important to be communicating, not just about what you are doing, but why you are doing it and why you are choosing the strategies you are choosing for approaching the problem that you're working on. Moreover, you need to show that you can approach a complex problem in a logical manner. So a good way to do this is to always start by asking clarifying questions. In fact, some interviewers will intentionally leave out some details of a question to see if you are going to ask the necessary good clarifying questions. Next, once you've clarified the question, you need to show that you can approach that question that you now understand in a logical manner. 
And the way to do this usually is going to be to break that question up into smaller subproblems that are going to be easier subproblems to solve. And by solving those subproblems, you will have solved the larger, bigger problem. You also want to demonstrate that you understand the importance of edge cases. Test your solution against things like an empty input to show that your solution is going to work and be the correct solution for any possible input. And now more than anything, like I said in the beginning, you need to be practicing, but not all practice is created equally. So if you want to know how to practice in the most efficient way possible, watch this video next.